Calumet Perspectives is sponsored by the Communication and Creative Arts Department at Purdue University Calumet. Our hosts have backgrounds in communication studies, journalism, public relations, and law. Our interest is in how mass media impacts public debate and culture. To my immediate right is Lee Arts. Lee's area, Lee's area of scholarship is media effects, social change, public debate, and cultural hegemony. He has a book titled The Media Globe, which will be of interest to us today. Uh, and also a book coming out later this year called Diversity Without Democracy. His PhD is in media studies from the University of Iowa, and he's a former steelworker and machinist. Uh, to Lee's right is Neil Nemeth. Neil's PhD is in mass communication with a minor in law from Indiana University. He also has an MA in journalism. Neil writes about accuracy in the news media and media accountability. He has a book on news ombudsman and social responsibility. Neil also worked as a journalist for four years before working on his PhD. My name is Tom Roach. I was also a steel worker and a journalist, <laughs> uh, which is not how I met them. Um, my PhD from Northwestern University is in rhetorical inquiry. I have an undergraduate degree in journalism, and I write industry columns on public relations. My scholarship is on censorship, journalism, and media effects. Today's topic is mass, the mass part of mass media. Uh, what does it mean to disseminate a message to hundreds of thousands of listeners or viewers? And I thought to get the conversation started, we might talk about what happened 50 years ago when the Beatles uh, appeared on the Ed Sullivan Show and begun what we now call Beatlemania. And I understand that that was engineered a lot more than we thought it was. I recently uh, <laughs> saw uh, something that's going around uh, on uh, emails uh, that's a document that talked about how they coordinated this, you know, the tape on the Jack Parr show and the, you know, the records being released at exactly the right time and the Ed Sullivan show. So did they, you know, did they manufacture Beatlemania or was it uh, an honest reaction to a phenomenal music group? What do you think? Well, I'll let Neil do the aesthetics I'd and the musicology on this. Say it's a combination <laughs> of both, having the right message, the right people to deliver the message, and the right channels of communication at that point in time. You know, this was, uh, Ed Sullivan was kind of a, uh, if not a relic, certainly becoming a relic at that point in time because his shows had gone way back into the 50s and the, and the late 1940s. And, um, you know, the infrastructure uh, today is quite different uh, and it would be very difficult to get uh, the size of an audience simply because today we have so many more choices in the mass media. I'm not saying that you couldn't manufacture uh, a similar sort of event, but I think it, 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 as calculated as that was, yeah. a, a similar effort today would have to be even more calculated today. So uh, one of your points, uh, and this is interesting, is that even though we have uh, more ways to distribute information to more people, it's really harder to put together as large an audience because of the diversity of, um, of media and, uh, and different breakdowns in publics, right? Yeah, there was some discussion. Uh, there was a, a, a congressional committee dealing with the challenges associated with newspapers four or five years ago, and John Kerry, who ran for president and is now the Secretary of State, was part of that committee, and one of the things that he noted, and of course he had a vested interest in this as a politician, but um, one of the things that he uh, took note of was the fact um, that it was getting much harder to get people to pay attention to your messages uh, from his point of view, and uh, he thought that that had an ultimate negative impact on democratic institutions and democratic life as time went on. I'm not sure that his committee came up with any sort of a significant way to solve the problem, but you know, even at, the, at that level in today's society, um, you're, the, the structure is different and the challenges are different and it's harder to get people all in the same place. We just had the Super Bowl, which is one of the handful of examples of where the public's attention span is fixated you know, in one place. 
uh, for a period of time. So um, where does mass media start? I, I, you know, maybe we should consider that. Um, well, I, I understand what Neil's saying. The thing that strikes me as the most interesting is who gets access to get that uh, mass audience, who is in a position to be able to distribute, whether it's a song or a, a political yeah. message in the newspapers. And I, th I think sometimes we get um, what sidelined by thinking because we have 200 choices on satellite or cable TV that somehow there's such a diversity of... Uh, viewpoints. There's certainly a diversity of genre, and it's true it would be hard to get one single audience like you might have had 50 years ago with three television networks. On the other hand, that audience, um, if you add all, all the audiences together, they're much larger than they are then. The thing that, that I <laughs> come back to when I watched the Beatles Grammy show last night was uh, we, we wouldn't have had the Beatles at all, probably, if it hadn't been for one record label. Um, EMI signed the Beatles. Decca told them no. Said, guitar music is gone. We don't want you. Every other major record label told them no. Um, two years ago, EMI was bought out by Universal Music Group, which belongs to Vivendi. If that would have happened in 50 years ago, EMI belonged to the Universal Group, the Beatles wouldn't have had a record. That, again, doesn't speak to whether it's great music or bad music or mediocre music. It just speaks to, without that contract with EMI, they wouldn't have had that distribution in Europe and then the distribution to the United States, and we may never have heard the Beatles. Although, without the access to the media, right. they couldn't sing their song. Well, and the orientation of those companies is they have a large infrastructure that they have to support. So they're interested in acts that they know are going to move hundreds of thousands of units and some outfit that's trying to get started has not built up the track record, so to speak. I think what you're yep. suggesting is there's no place at the table, or certainly a much smaller place. You can use the aspects of social media, for instance, um, to get at least some of your attention out there. But the bottom line is the infrastructure has changed so much, and the orientation of quote unquote traditional ways of getting things out. Uh, it's oriented strictly to profit, and they're not going to mess around with their 20, 30, 40, 50,000 copies. They want half a million because they have an infrastructure that has to be supported. But this is, it's, it's still market-driven, and going back to the Beatles for a second, um, one of the, I think one of the real interesting things about their history um, is that they, um, they came back from their second uh, tour in, in Hamburg, Germany, and they'd been playing you know, 10 hours a day, six days a week, and they had evolved, and they didn't realize it. And they came back, and they, they took off for, for four or five weeks. And, um, and the mother of the drummer scheduled them to play a, a gym in um, Litherland, England, I think. Actually, it was a, city, a town hall in Litherland, England. And Did they have Ringo then? Or was they didn't the have Ringo. There's no Ringo. The other Sans Ringo, right? Yeah, okay. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think his name was Pete Best. He was one of several people called the Fifth Beatle, right? Yeah. But, but anyway... Um, so they, uh, they got together for this. I don't, I, don't, I don't think they even rehearsed for it. They weren't sure what they wanted to do, but they got together and they put them on after the break. And, and people were milling around, uh, you know, kind of broke up for, for 10 minutes or something. And they, they pulled the curtain open and McCartney started singing Long Tall Sally. And uh, everybody was there, uh, has the same account. The crowd rushed the stage. They had no idea who these guys were, and they rushed the stage. So there was something going on with the, with the, with the, the, the beat that they had and with the, uh, the intensity uh, of their performance that just was, draw was drawing crowds. And so I would take the counter-argument on that, at least you know, for our purpose of our discussion. <laughs> you know, um, if, um, if you've got a band that is that um, interesting, right, that is uh, making that much um, noise, uh, no pun intended, uh, uh, doesn't the market force the, the media industry to pay some attention to them and to eventually give them a shot? Well, I think what, what Neil said is if the, if, and, the, and the market's not some abstract thing out there like the universe. There's companies that work in that market. So yes, if a company thinks it's worth the, uh, uh, the risk, which is why most music companies now have independent labels and garage bands and they try to work their way up to get discovered. They're not going to take that risk. But certainly the aesthetic or the appeal or the, um, the creative potential of any, any music or any novel 
uh, can't just be simply because the media is going to market it. On the other hand, the constant repetition oftentimes can cover up uh, what you right. might say is not aesthetically pleasing. At the same time, um, j just because you're a great star, if you don't perform the way that the media company wants you to, or in the proper political context, you aren't going to get access. The Dixie Chicks were put off the air by Clear Channel when they said something that they didn't think was appropriate for George Bush. They were basically censored. Um, now in Russia, uh, Pussy Riot, the, the rock group, is not just off the air, they're in jail. So it isn't sufficient right. to even be a popular uh, music group with things that uh, a public may want. You also have to have the permission, essentially, of the media organization, and sometimes beyond that, well, to the sales regulation. And controversy is what you're essentially getting at. Here. The, the media didn't put Pussy Riot in jail, though, right? I mean, that's uh, there's always the state, right? Uh, and essentially, uh, you know, if you if you jail someone, uh, you censored them, right? Uh, if you shoot JFK, you've censored uh, uh, an important voice uh, right. for important issues. But the media in Russia did stop playing their music. They chose to do that. Yeah. Just like in this country, all of the affiliates of Clear Channel stopped playing Dixie Chicks. Yeah. I mean, and before that, we're talking about Ed Sullivan. Ed Sullivan said when Elvis came on, they weren't going to show him from the waist down because I was, it wasn't a... You know, I don't know if that's true. I was but, watching that night. I remember that distinctly. <laughs> was, there was so much talk about it. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, well, they raised, actually showed him, and then the camera moved back up quickly. Yeah. yeah, but it raises the question of what is pop culture, what is art, and what happens when you merge something that has an artistic aspect to it and you try and make money from it? Yeah, and, I, and, and kind of to uh, muck up the work here for a minute, yeah. what, what's, the, what's the fellow that's from Korea that does Gangnam Style? Is it Gangnam Style? Mm -hmm. Where he dances around and got a million hits? I don't oh, know. Oh, right. A hundred right. million or more. Yeah, yeah. I Neil's, know, Neil's a fan, right, Neil? <laughs> no. <laughs> Tell us about it. <laughs> Maybe he'll do that yeah. now. But well, I don't know if he has a record label, and I don't know if he gets yeah. played on uh, Clear Channel today, but he's, it's almost a novelty act that right. get, attracts his attention. Well, so in that sense, you could argue that the social media or the media that we have today does allow some minimal access, but I would say it's mostly a novel um, well, access, not, well, well, not truly did, mass so there's, Where did Justin Bieber get his start, though? We're, we're really uh, descending here. Okay, uh, let me, let me just say, just to, just just to kind of um, uh, clarify. So we're outlining two, two points here, right? One is that the point that I'm making is that if something is really extraordinary, um, media almost has to deal with it or cover it. Not, maybe not always, but, but it, you can, you can uh, advance yourself, I think, on merit in some cases, right? But the other point is that by putting something out through the mass media, uh, you can take something that maybe is of little worth Right, and make it seem to have uh, greater value. Right? I mean, what about all those people who are famous just for being famous on that yeah. side of the argument? Right? The, or, or what about all the people that are in yeah. garage bands that have uh, great musical productions that we will never hear because they didn't get heard by the proper right. uh, producer with the proper label? Right. And we're told by DECA or now EMI, no, that's not, that's not going to work for us. Welcome back. So let's, uh, let's shift away from the Beatles for a second uh, and look at the darker side of this. What about when uh, mass media was used to, um, to get America uh, ready for World War I? Woodrow Wilson hires George Creel, one of the top PR people in the country. He puts together a committee of pretty much everyone who was uh, of any importance at the time in, uh, in public relations and mass media. And they run a campaign, and the next thing you know, um, we're uh, we're on our way to Europe and we're fighting in World War One, and you know and then the uh, and you know to to add on to that I mean then uh, uh, the Nazi Party in Germany right rising to power uh, with uh, Goebbels engineering the uh, uh, you know all of their uh, media strategies and and claiming that he learned everything he was doing from the Creel Committee. So you know I mean is it is it that easy to do you know Orson Welles broadcasts. Uh, War of the Worlds on the radio, and he's got people jumping out of windows? Or? Well, some people. Not, not, not everyone, well, right? 
Yes, some and, people. And of course, the interesting thing to note on that is that he was not punished by the Federal Communications Commission, even though there were people who wanted that to happen. Yeah. You know, it was a situation where uh, I think he was very savvy. It got him attention, and of course, we know the rest of the story. He became a very famous movie director, right. and this was an important stepping stone getting people to pay attention to him. There was a nice PBS documentary done um, last um, Halloween that, that brought this point out. Well, but what about the ease with which he was able to do that? I, I've always wondered if, you know, really, if that could have, something like that could even happen again. I mean, it, it, it sort of gave mass media well, uh, a bad uh, name. But. Yeah, again, again, I think it uh, has to be put in its cultural context because I think on the one hand, you could argue that that was uh, uh, the kind of thing that happened with the U.S. Uh, invasion of Iraq most recently. That was partly an orchestrated media event. I'm not going to say the media is responsible for it, but the media certainly lubricated the political conversation such that people were um, um, kind of limited in the options that we were given. Uh, but they certainly uh, on the other side they mediated the discussion about uh, whether or not there were weapons of mass destruction there well i would it, see it, i would argue wasn't. no that they did. no they didn't in fact just the opposite i mean the new york times reporter judith miller relied upon a cia informant Chalbeed, for all of her stories about the weapons of mass destruction they knew before going in that there weren't any weapons of mass destruction most of the media the journalists in particular also knew that but it wasn't something that would um, um, be able to be reported on the front page without some ramification in sales or even some political blowback. Uh, what was the man's well, name, um, Meyer, that's, that uh, was, was counseled by uh, Bush's, Bush's uh, press secretary to watch what you say? I mean, this is the same period that the Dixie Chicks were pulled off the air. But this was at a time when... Oh, Meyer's career ended. Yeah, it, well, yeah. so, I mean, it's, th 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 this isn't World War II. This is right. at the start of the invasion of the U.S. But even at the beginning, the American people weren't in favor of it. The polls showed that most, most of us were not in favor of it. But as the, as the process goes forward, that discussion is no longer part of the discussion. Now it becomes, should the U.S. invade with or without the U.N.? And then after the U.S. is there, it becomes a question, um, do you support the troops or not support the troops, which completely shifted the conversation, didn't mean that the American public's attitude towards the war per se had changed, but a different question was asked. So I see it not so much that the media uh, creates this effect and moves people to do this, but they certainly can shift what the conversation is going to be about. And it isn't... Which is agenda setting, right? Which is with yes, the, 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 one, the one yeah. clear uh, power that mass media has. It sets the agenda. It, 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 it may or may not always uh, have a, an impact on public opinion, but it, it will always have an impact on the public agenda. Well, let's not discount the other factor that's lurking in the background, and that is the corporate control. Um, the, the media companies have become very much establishment players. Uh, they want certain favors out of Washington, D.C. How do they get those things? They get those things by, quote, unquote, behaving. Um, and of course, if the entertainment division of a particular network wants something or needs something, uh, is the news division does the news division have the, the power and the um, clout to uh, do something that would be contrary to the corporate interest today? Um, I think increasingly the answer is no. Um, where there is some hope, I think, would be in uh, the efforts of citizen journalists, for instance, and people who are kind of flying underneath the radar screen. Right. Um, and I'm not saying that it's impossible to affect any change in, in, the, in the traditional forms of media, but you kind of have to understand where they're coming from. They are motivated now because they are part of corporate America to maximize their profits. How do they do that? Right. By not incurring um, expenses associated with lawsuits, and they also do it by cutting back the size of their staffs. What's the likelihood of the sort of questions that Dr. Arts is interested in having the answers to? What's the likelihood of those questions being asked, given that state of affairs? Or, or when they are, like when Peter Arnett asked those questions, he was fired. I mean, a prize-winning journalist right. who made CNN what it was for on-the-spot immediate reporting is doing the same thing. Right. This time when he goes to Baghdad, he's cut off immediately yeah. because all the embedded reporters were providing the uh, type of report that was 
um, acceptable in the, in the, well, in the discourse well, at the time. Well, it's, it's the nature of mass communication that you have uh, one source going out to millions, perhaps, right, of, of receivers, right? And so anytime uh, one person or, or a small group can get control of that source, obviously they're getting control of, of what's going out to the large group. Um, so in this case, we're saying, well, you know, should the, uh, the processes by which we mediate news, right, have, you know, have uh, determined what was being covered, or was it just, you know, was it being determined by people who had control over the, over the technology, essentially, right? And, and I think we're clearly siding with the, with the second part of that argument. But what, what about um, uh, the possibility that, that social media neutralizes that, that power? Um, that, that even though the state maybe uh, controls the, um, you know, the, the television broadcast and the radio broadcast, that people with uh, cell phones and Facebook pages and, uh, and things like that can get out contrary messages? I, I, I think that's possible. Um, I, I don't think it's a technological question, though. I think it's a political question and a cultural question. We were talking during the break about Egypt and the use of social media, both YouTube and Twitter and yeah. Facebook, and how it was, uh, it became a means to um, communicate to everybody that there's a demonstration against the Mubarak uh, dictatorship. Right, right. Um, I know the study that I did in Nicaragua, the, the, uh, the Nicaraguan opponents to Somoza didn't have Facebook, they didn't have cell phones. What they had was a can of paint, and they would paint on the walls at night. Um, I think if there is a population that truly wants democracy and there's a motivation for it, the means of communication will either be found or be constructed. In the case of Egypt, it was uh, the social media. Mm -hmm. But to rely upon that as its sole uh, motivator isn't going to happen because, again, at a certain point, the Egyptian government pulled the plug and Google cooperated. Well, they're not exactly real comfortable right now in Egypt. I don't, you know, it's not like they put this down completely. No, but uh, again, the, the technology remains there for the, the democratic yeah. movement in, in Egypt. It's not that they don't have the technology, it's that they don't have a program, they don't have a policy, they don't have a clear direction. So the, they could use the technology, but to do what? Without a, without a force that uh, has to be reckoned with. On the other hand, um, even if you dominate and control the media entirely, like dictatorships have in Latin America for right. decades, that isn't enough to stop the population because there's interpersonal communication, there's, right. uh, there's, there's uh, meetings at the church, right. there's meetings in the local pub, there is other means of communication. I know in Nicaragua they used shortwave radio because that was one of the few means of communication they had. That and painting on the wall. So they used graffiti, which well, has been used historically for years too. So I don't, I, I'm saying yes, yeah. the technology is available, but it isn't the solution to a larger problem of what kind of world do we want? Well, to I, yeah, I'm not suggesting there's a solution there. I'm just, <laughs> but, but I, I just think it, it's, it's worth pointing out that perhaps um, 1920, 1930, 1940, because there were so few channels for mass communication. It was easier right? to dominate. That it was easier to dominate it, right. And so as we, you know, it's like we were even saying about, you know, the, uh, the Beatles phenomena, right? I mean, could, could anyone get an audience like that again? I, you know, uh, our generation, uh, somebody says, uh, you know, brings up a song, they say, oh, question mark in the Mysterians. Uh, yeah. You know, and, and we all know what song that was and, and we know the words to it because if you were listening to the radio, if you were listening to AM radio and look for music, in the 60s, you had two options in Chicago, WLS or WCFL, and they were playing the same music. Uh, and so the, you know, the record companies had more power, uh, and the stations had more power because they were the only channel that we were listening to, right? But I, you know, I, I taught a pop rock and rhetoric class, and, and I would bring up, I tried to you know, be, be you know, tuned in and bring up current music and stuff, and you know, half, half of the people in the class never knew what I was talking about because there's such a diversity of, of channels and, and sources I out there. I bet you half your class wouldn't know what you were talking about if you started talking about the current country western star either. Yeah, right, right. yeah, it would be the same thing, yeah. Right, yeah. but, but I, would be, I would be cautious to say that there's a, a less consolidation of the media now than then because then there were two stations where now we have 15. Because in the Chicago wow. market, for instance, Clear Channel owns 14 right. stations, and they, ha and they dominate the rap station, the urban contemporary. Right. They dominate them each. 
under, we well, have a right. diversity of genre, right. but the, 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 the conditions of production and reception um, are more complex, but that relationship is the same. It's what you said before. A few uh, broadcasting to the And many. adding on top of that, their channel's orientation is to be efficient so that they can maximize their profits. They have, I don't know, 200 or 300 employees down in San Antonio. That's all they have to run everything. Well, how do you run things with so few people? Well, you create the content once and distribute it as widely as possible. But that's not reflective of American values in American society, which uh, is dominated by individual uh, expression and freedom. Why should people in Hammond, Indiana, for instance, have to listen to the same thing that could be produced um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico? The two places are very different. But yet the orientation of the media today, because of these corporate issues that we, I've just brought up, it, it's, it, we're, we're not the same country all across the United States. And the challenge is because of the need to generate uh, profits, right. uh, the, the companies are oriented toward giving us the same thing no matter where we live. And this raises Sounds another like topics for several issues. Shows. Yes, <laughs> uh, it raises an issue for another show, which is the impact that this has then on culture, because it does eliminate um, the diversity of lifestyle and opinion and, uh, and taste. And well, it doesn't like that. eliminate it. I mean, as part of the Cable Act, for instance, it, it there, filters there, it. Yes. There, 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 there is local access. But the channels uh, of, of communication are not that good. The technical quality is not that good. So as a result, the viewership is not there. OK, very good. Well, I think that uh, wraps up our talk for today. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Neil Nemeth and uh, Dr. Lee Arts. And I'm Tom Roach. Thank you. Experience for a Lifetime. At Purdue Calumet, you'll combine a Purdue education with rich, work-related experience that impresses employers. Experience for a Lifetime. At Purdue Calumet, you'll take what you learn in the classroom and apply it to a real-world environment. At Purdue Calumet, you'll gain experience for a lifetime. Phone 1-800-HIDE-PURDUE. 1-800-H-I-P-U-R-D-U-E.